now, Super Thursday continues with Switzer. Hello, I'm Peter Switzer. Welcome to the program which puts you in touch with the best and brightest minds in the business. On tonight's show, I've been saying since New Year that this stock market is crazy. And this week it has been crazy, stupid love of a market going up. But can it last? Roger Montgomery and Michael McCarthy will see if this rally has legs or not. Legendary fund manager Jeff Wilson will lend his historical perspective to this week's rally. Is it a real McCoy or a sucker's rally? We'll find out why Westpac is giving giving away millions of dollars worth of grants to local communities. And we'll meet the CEO of Jigsaw and find out how uh, Australia fits into his game plan for 2016. Stay with us for the next hour. We'll bring you all the latest corporate news and market analysis, plus learn some valuable lessons from Australian success stories. If you have any questions for me or our guests, email them to switzer at switzer.com.au. You can follow me on Twitter and the handle is at Peter Switzer. But first, joining me up on the desk, Roger Montgomery, Chief Investment Officer, Montgomery Investment Management and Michael McCarthy, Chief Market Strategist at CMC Markets. And we'll test out whether we can trust this rally. Of course, I trust these guys, so what they say, we can trust as well. So, guys, thanks for joining us. What a, thanks, what brother. A lovely introduction. Thank yeah, you. well, you know, quality people, quality show. <laughs> All right, now, the interesting thing is, probably two weeks ago, um, Macca, you were like a greyhound. Don't get out of the boxes to buy. Severing. Roger, you were a little bit more <laughs> circumspect. You, you had, you had. Oh wait, but that's our permanent yeah, that's state. Right. Yeah, he's Indeed. permanent state is opposite. But, <laughs> no, but not really. No, you, you, I know. I'm a trader, Peter. I'm a trader. But sometimes you, you can be negative as well. Uh, let's start with you. Cause I, I think you, you, did you have 40 percent cash or something about two weeks ago? About 25, 25 okay. percent cash. Okay. Have you changed um, your attitude from what you've seen this week? Not really. Um, what's really interesting is that the, the high quality end of the market where we invest, mm. um, we haven't seen a lot of value emerge. Mm. Um, we're no good at market timing, so no. we just wait for these opportunities to buy these things when they're cheap. And, yeah. and, and the sort of companies that we own, like Challenger, for example, and REA and Altium and a bunch of others, they all had great results. Mm. Um, they've, they've moved higher. They haven't gotten cheaper. Mm. Um, we've got enough of them, mm. so our cash remains reasonably high. Yeah. Um, Macca, what about you? How have you seen this you know, post-earnings rally? And... I'm going to ask you in a minute, is it because of the earnings? Or, or, but what, what, what have you seen this? Well, I think the market pricing is moving more towards the evidence. Right? We saw this yesterday with the GDP data. We're also worried for the last few months. We're revising our growth expectations downward, down, down, down to 2.5%. Turned out it was 3% all along. So I, I take a lesson out of that. We've been doing that as a market for a long time. And we're attaching a very big risk premium to particular stocks at the moment for events that may or may not happen. Now, it's, honest disagreement is a part of markets, and I strongly disagree with those who think a catastrophe is a reasonable chance. It's always a possibility. We can never rule it out. But those people who think that a financial Armageddon is coming sometime this year haven't really made a case. It's all if that and that, that and that, that might happen. Yeah. Right? As I say, we can't ever rule these risks out, but the idea that it's the most likely scenario I think is wrong, and I think we need to more, remove more of a risk premium. That is, share prices need to go higher. Okay, Roger, do you think there's a financial Armageddon out there waiting? to happen? I think, I think there's always a risk of a black swan event. Mm. Um, uh, and we're delighted that we've got enough cash, uh, but we're not in the business of predicting these things. Mm. Um, we're just looking for the opportunity to buy great businesses when they're cheap. Mm. Um, look, the quality, the quality of Chinese loan books is deteriorating. We know that for a fact. Mm. Um, we know that the companies that have been lent uh, about 10% of the $3.3 trillion that have been accumulated in debt over the last eight years in China and US dollars, those companies are going to find it very, very hard if the renminbi uh, is devalued. Do I think it needs to be devalued right now? I don't know. Um, but the, that sort of, that sort of smouldering away in the background, mm. it might be put out mm. uh, and it might become something more significant. We aren't investing on that basis. We aren't waiting for something to happen. Um, we're just waiting for great businesses to be presented to us at a cheap price. OK, well, I'm, I'm going to ask you both this question, but I'll start with you first, uh, Mako. Um, oil prices and iron ore prices, what's going on there? That, that was the bane of the markets early this year, going down, going down, scaring the pants off us, and now they're going up. Last Is it a sign that maybe demand's starting to improve? Oh, I just want to tell the story of last night. We have got 
inventories in the US at record levels. The US is almost a quarter of both the supply and demand side of the oil market. It's an important component. It's the biggest oil producer now too, America. Bigger than Saudi. Yeah, and, cheap, and, and, and their production costs have come down as well. Yeah, yeah. It has so, really backfired. Mm. Well, things are changing. But last night they reported that over the course of last week, there was another 10 million barrels of oil thrown on that already record level pile of, of, of reserves. Yeah. Normally, I'd expect to see oil prices get smashed yeah. in that scenario, and they didn't. Yeah. They actually rose a percent. Now, now, so obviously the supply has not petered out like Saudi was hoping it would, would, ha would happen. But do you think possibly? We, we don't know if, if it's a supply or a demand issue. We're, well, we we're, know we're, with iron ore, it's definitely a supply issue, and it's not changing. Yeah. But, but 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 why why is China uh, paying higher iron ore prices now? Well. I don't, know the answer. I, I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that we've got a whole bunch of companies like Vale, Fortescue Metals Group, um, ArcelorMittal. Well, you're now. But mm. very highly geared. Oh, OK. Yeah. And when they've got a fixed interest expense, mm. as the price goes down, they have to produce more. Mm. So we don't think that the supply um, bogey is actually going to go away any time soon. Mm. And so I suspect if I was going to make one prediction, it would be that this rally in iron ore prices will probably reserve, reverse. Reverse. Okay. I'd, I'd take the other case there. Um, what, one of the things that I think is important to bear in mind about the iron ore market is the fact that a lot of it is not seaborne. Right? In China, for example, they produce 90% of the iron ore that they use every year. They produce 90% themselves and they only buy 10% of their requirements from the rest of the world. Sure. One of the factors in China on the ground is that there's a certain nationalism involved in being in a crucial industry like this, which means they're keeping alive high-cost producers, producers who are losing money on their operations. And while you can do that for a while, that's not going to last forever. If I was going to nominate an area where the supply side is going to give, it would be those high-cost Chinese producers. And we've already seen a shuttering of some mines. I suspect that that's going to be the story. It would be incremental cuts to supply as those high-cost high Chinese producers, along with other high cost producers like we have here in Australia exit the market and, okay. and these, these things well, will be yeah, shut the, the only issue with that theory is that well that thesis is that they can continue to produce just to keep people employed and they're happy to produce at a loss you know, histor history shows us that it's a mistake to believe that um, the cost of production is the floor of the price. You know, the price can go oh, below the cost of production for a long, long time. Yeah, the Saudi Arabia is actually doing it right now. By definition, now. that means people are producing it below the cost of production. So China is a classic example of a country that could continue to do that. Mm. Um, again, don't know, just think that mm. it will probably come off again. OK, I, I know you and I have talked many times around how important is economic growth to, you know, uh, various not at all. share prices, and, and you always say not at all. Not at all. I disagree it, with you. And, 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 well, and there's plenty of academic evidence that, to show there's no the opposite as well. There's opposite as well that, that, that actually disprove. But we have to prove that point. The bottom line is, what are what are going to be the the key factors that will provide buying opportunities in the sort of companies that you like? Uh, interest rates and returns on equity. So the ability to retain large amounts of capital and redeploy it at a very high rate of return. Um, what we've found though in the last, particularly the last 12 months, is that many boards of public companies have acquiesced to shareholder demands for higher dividends. Mm. They've raised their payout ratio. So that's boosted the share price in the short term because obviously people who wanted yield have chased those shares. Mm. But what we actually found is that um, it hasn't been supported by growth mm. because there's no capital being retained to grow earnings beyond last year's earnings. Mm. And so Telstra is a classic example of that. People have chased it for its yield. It's been a good run from $2.60 or thereabouts up to $6.60. But if you look at the share price today compared to 15 years ago, it's actually lower than where it was 15 years ago. And what's even more interesting is they just came out with their first half results for 2016 and they reported earnings per share of 17.1 cents. Guess what? For the first half of 2006, so up to the six, six months ending December 31st, 2005, precisely 10 years ago, the earnings per share was 17.2 cents. So they haven't grown the, 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 the one tenth of one percent lower earnings per share than 10 years ago. So if you're going to have sustained increases in share prices, which is what we would all like, um, you need to have it supported by earnings growth. And for a lot of those big blue chips, it's just not supported by earnings growth because the payout ratio is now too high. Maka, do you think a lot of those blue chips that you know, Roger's referring to, 
got beaten up more than they deserve to in the first part of this year because they're the ones who've actually improved this week, haven't they? Because a lot of the companies that you've been chasing, some quality smaller or mid-cap companies, yep. they've already done pretty well and the blue chips were beaten up. Do you think the blue chips have more... Yeah, a lot of people have been asking me, you know, would you be buying banks now? And, and, and early, this, early or late last week, I said, yes, it's, at these prices, I would. And so far, I've been right. But I could be wrong in two weeks' time. Maka, what, what do you think? Absolutely. I, there's too much risk premium attached to share prices at the moment, across the board, as a general observation. Now, some, some companies deserve that sort of risk premium, but a lot of them don't. And I think particularly those blue chips have plenty of potential over the next six months. Uh, I have little doubt that we're going to see 5,400 on the index sometime this year. That it's uh, about 65 or 7% higher from here. How the market reacts at that point will be important. Um, remember, too, that the selling that we saw sparked a lot of selling. Buying can do the same. Mm -hmm. So if we do start to see sustained and steady rise, that's going to attract investors back in as well. And we can get an acceleration. Now, I look at things like, I look at it from an investor point of view, what are the dividend yields? Mm -hmm. And I ran it on the banks again. Well, for ANZ and NAB, we're still talking uh, dividend yields, including franking, of more than 9%. Now, dividends can be cut. Mm -hmm. Very possible. But unless you think there's a housing crisis coming in Australia, and I definitely don't think that, mm. those dividend yields are very attractive in a low interest rate environment. Mm. So for mine, that all adds up um, as part of a diversified portfolio, as long as you're not too narrowly focused on that sector, yes, I do think these are good prices to be buying blue chips. OK. Um, you don't often chase banks, but you have bought banks at certain times where you thought the price was right, haven't you? I think, I think Michael made a good point earlier on. You know, Michael's a, a trader. And we are very long-term investors. We've got no ability to predict when the popularity of stocks is going to change, which is what Michael's talking about. So if you buy the banks on a yield of 9%, grossed up, obviously, for the franking credits, um, and their payout ratio is close to 100%, then you're, that's your maximum return that 9%. The only way you can get more is if you get a capital gain, and the only way you can get a capital gain is to speculate that the PE ratio expands. Back to my point, we're not speculators. We don't know when that's going to happen. So we're looking for more than the return from the dividend yield. And in order to get that, we've got to invest in companies that are actually retaining some of their profits and compounding it. Now, in terms of the big caps, Telstra hasn't grown its profits in 10 years. Um, BHP and Rio challenged. Woolies, West Farmers challenged by Aldi. The banks, they've already said that their credit growth is going to be somewhat slower than it has been in the past. But that could have been based on some hopeless predictions by their economists, because most <laughs> Well, no, it was well, in response well, to two things. It no, was but, in response but, 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 yeah. but, yeah, most of the banking economists has growing at 0.4%. percent yeah. has growing at 2.5%. Yeah, so, no, so a bit of growth will help the banks. That, that's true, but, but what they've done is, you know, they've had to slow credit lending to for investor mortgages. Mm. They've also had to increase their set one ratios, their capital, uh, their common equity tier one ratios. Mm. That's why, by the way, the, one of the things you're going to see over the next few years, we believe, is you're going to see all the banks backing out of wealth management and starting to spin off mm. their wealth management more and more because it's more capital intensive yeah. and they simply can't afford it. Yeah. Um, so that could be great for the financial planning community. It could be great for investors because it could mean more independence um, from those big dealer groups that were always hitched to the banks mm. and promoting just the bank products. But that's an aside. OK. So we, we're running out of time. We've, we've got five minutes left or so. Let's talk about companies that you like. Now, what, what companies do you like at the moment, Maka? Mate, I'd like to steer away from that just a little. There's a setup I particularly like at the okay, moment. Yeah. It's buy stock and buy the put. Now, this only really applies in about the top 30 companies. Once you get outside the top 30, it's very difficult to trade in their options. Mm -hmm. You can still do it out to about, I think there are 92 option uh, listed stocks at the moment. Right. But, but Give amongst us an those... example. For, for, for OK, so, so if about. BHP, if you, if you think Pete could be right, but you're worried that um, Roger's challenges are going to knock the share price again before it finds a base, one of the things you can do is buy the share mm -hmm. and buy a put option. Mm -hmm. So BHP currently trading around $17. You buy it at $17 and you buy a... September 1550 put. Mm. Okay, that means in your worst case scenario, if BHP craters, mm. you've got protection at 1550. The most you've got at risk of your capital is a dollar fifty plus what you spend on the put. How much you, is the put? Well, I haven't priced the SEPs right now. Mm. I'd be, I'm pulling this one out of my hat, Roger. I'd be think overall in, at current volatilities, the cost of hedging for the full year will be around two and a half to three percent of the share price rough rule of thumb right. for those big blue chips at current volatilities. So around 3% mm. for the, to protect it for the full year. Because a, a, a full hedge probably costs you your yield. 
on those on those stocks over a course of a yeah, year. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. some people would probably be prepared to do it because the yield yeah. is, is a lot lower than they expected. Correct. If, yeah. Okay. But as volatility picks up, well, you, if you, do, you don't if, want to pay if, for volatility. If, if you do it in a bank, mm. um, of course, your yield will more than pay for the yeah. cost of your protection. Yeah, so, so there indeed. is that aspect. You get to collect the dividends if you uh, structure it right. You get to collect your dividends and your franking. So um, you can sit in there with capital protection. You are at risk for that amount between the, the strike yeah. price of the put and, and, and the stock, but you've got extreme downside protection yeah. and if you do get the capital gain that I think will come through for exactly the reasons that you mentioned Roger that the PEs It'll will expand your outlay on, on the well, wood. well yeah. exactly you write the put off or you roll it up and then chase the share price and of course these are volatile times and, and, and options can be you know can well, you be pay good. a premium when, it, when it's well, volatile I, I, sorry I'm, a, I'm an options specialist I've been a former market maker volatilities still historically are low yeah, right? yeah. 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 so rough rule of thumb pre GFC index volatility 25% today 19% okay now Roger uh, company three three like. companies. Good three. Um, three companies. The first one is um, uh, Challenger, mm -hmm. which I think I've mentioned before. Yeah, you have, you have. Still cheap, yeah. we think. We're fairly priced, on the cheap side of fairly priced. Okay. But, you know, a long run growth profile going out to perhaps two. There's a blue chip company as well. Very high okay, quality. What kind of dividends does it pay, Roger? Roughly. We don't follow the yield. Yeah, but you must know, you must get a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a big part of the story, I have okay. to say. You know, okay. it'd be 2 or 3%. Okay, right, go um, on. Next. Uh, next one, REA Group. Mm -hmm. um, we think that's quite cheap, and uh, we've owned it for a long time. Why? Admittedly. Why is it cheap? Well, because we believe that the intrinsic value is, is higher than where it is. We don't think the market appreciates um, the upside, even in the event of a, uh, any decline or, or dislocation in property prices in Australia. In fact, they'll make more money yeah. if the property market comes off. And that happens because they make their revenue from the number of listings yeah. multiplied by the length of time the listing appears yeah. on yep. their website. Yep. Um, and the last one is Altium. And Altium uh, is in the business of producing the software that electrical engineers use uh, to build circuit boards. and. Uh, and they've just bought a business. Um, they've just bought a business that allows electrical engineers and mechanical engineers to come together. They believe that's the upside. Uh, but even in the absence of that, they are cheap at current prices. Okay. Now we'll view a question quickly. I'll go to you, Mac, on this. And it's around a company. What is happening to Tractile? Its IPO. You, you recommended it a month ago. Yeah, I'm disappointed in this one, Peter. They're supposed to list today. Wow. Uh, let's close the, um, the uh, book build off and list today. They've deferred it for a week. They issued a supplementary prospectus yesterday. That's the mm. second supplementary prospectus. Now, Don't you worry? Yes, it does. Yeah. Because this product still looks very good to me. I still like the structure, but I like management who deliver on what they say they're mm. going to do. Mm. And so this concerns me. I don't think it writes it off, but anybody who's thinking about getting involved in this book build should satisfy themselves that this management will keep faith with investors. Mm. Um, that would be my only question mark over it. The rest of it hasn't changed. At this stage it's due to close next Thursday, yeah. the 10th. Um, let's see how that well, goes. Roger, have you on your right over Tractile? No, haven't even heard of it. Yeah, but you usually do look at IPOs, don't we, you? We, we look at those that uh, we can invest in because their size is appropriate. I suspect that this is a relatively small one. What's that? Raising between six and nine million, yes. Oh, six so. and nine million is right at the oh, micro. Yeah, okay. right Right okay. at the micro end, sorry. In. Okay, that's all right. You have to apologise for being the big end of town. Uh, no, not the big end of town, I'm just teasing. So, of course, guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I, I probably didn't ask this, this question. Do you think this rally is going to last or do you think it's going to... I don't know. Don't don't know. question to ask me. Charts say yes. Charts say yes. Okay. Let's, let's go with that. Okay. Uh, uh, Roger Montgomery and uh, Michael McCarthy, thanks for joining us on the show. Pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Okay, coming up after the break, we'll be talking to Jeff Wilson to see what he thinks of this rally right now.